praise the Lord. Uh, George, we really thank you for that. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting there as it's coming to an end, and I, I'm thinking, I don't even know how to follow up with something like that. The uh, only thing I know to do is uh, we'll preach the word, though, and see what that, but that was very moving and very timely and very important for us. So praise the Lord as we remember and as we continue to stand. So, well, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 1, and uh, we'll read the first nine verses, Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you, and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there would be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven... Uh, preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have preached un than that we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed, as we said before. So say I now again: If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for men and women who. Uh, who died and all the family and all the people who were left behind to uh, to carry on we thank you for the sir for the uh, the service of our troops and the sacrifices that they have all made but as we come together to study around your word may we rejoice in the message of grace and the dispensation of grace may we find comfort in knowing and having and knowing how to have that special relationship with you which only brings honor and glory to your son the Lord Jesus Christ and it's in his name we pray Amen. You know, we read these first nine verses of the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 1, and we say, man, what's going, what's going on here? Well, you know, this is probably one of the sternest rebukes that the Apostle Paul has, or sternest warnings that he has in all of what, he's, uh, what he, all he wrote in his 13 epistles. And it's something that should bring us to mind and uh, really bring our thoughts and, and our awareness that the gospel which we preach, that it's important that we know exactly what it is. Because untold millions of believers today believe that the gospel which we preach today is the same as the gospel which was preached in every age. And that's just not true. There are many gospel. Gospel simply means good news, and we've studied this before, even in light of this passage here. We've studied the gospel, and the gospel that Paul's talking about, the good news that he's talking about, is the good news that was committed to him and given to him by the risen and glorified Lord Jesus Christ that spoke to him from heaven after the stoning of Stephen, after Paul, Saul of Tarsus then met the Lord on the road to Damascus, after Paul met the Lord, believed that he was Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God, and God said to him, and he says to Paul, or Saul, he said, and Saul says to the Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And when we read that and hear that statement, when we read Romans to Philemon, we find out exactly what that meant. Because this is what the Lord would have him to do. And he says in verse 1, Paul an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now there may be some questions about that verse. There may be some things that do. But what we want to do is block out all the noise and just literally read this and say, what does it say? We don't have to look for hidden meaning. We don't have to look to see well, what, is, what is trying to be said to us between the lines. It's very straight, very plain, very understandable if we don't let these things do it. How many people, would? how many other apostles, the other, the 12 apostles, how many of them could say that they did not receive their commission or their authority from a man? Well, if you want to deny the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, he was God manifest in the flesh, he was the Son of God, but he was here in the flesh, where did they get theirs? He was a man. <laughs> but 
the Apostle Paul received it from the risen and glorified. And they got their message face to face. So it was different. And he says this in verse 11. He says in 12, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Once again, don't try to read anything into these verses that, that isn't there. Don't try to read between the lines. Don't try to take all the things that you hear out there about what others may say about this. Just let the words on the page be the final authority of what it says. You know the comfort that comes from that? It means that I can allow the Holy Spirit to be my teacher without the influence of others. Now God uses other people and other men. And it's when, they, when you can read a verse and it just sim it's simple until we start getting others' opinions about it. That's what confuses it. But we just, and we praise God, that the one thing, probably one of the greatest things that, that uh, I came to understand apart from the doctrine, is that I can trust and believe my Bible first and foremost. That God is not speaking to us in parables and secrets and, and what have you. And if he's going to talk in an allegory, guess what happens? We're told he's going to be speaking in an allegory. We don't have to wonder, is this true, is this figurative, or is this uh, an allegory? He says this is what it is. God's plan for us is to let the Bible say what it says. And it means to us today in the dispensation of grace what it meant to the Galatians. And that makes it simple. So we come along and, and in Galatians, we learn a couple of things. We learn, one, about the uniqueness of the Pauline revelation. We call it Pauline revelation because that's the revelation that was given to him by the Lord Jesus Christ. We learn the uniqueness and the uh, distinctiveness, not only of his apostleship, was, was, which was absolutely different and had no connection to any of the other apostles that came before Paul. And we also learn about the uniqueness of his message. His message, as we know, and uh, depending on where we are today, we may get to look at it again. His message is not about Jesus Christ according to prophecy. He's not about that which is not in the yellow. <laughs> this is a fantastic chart. This is a chart that I would think that we could, we could use and we could learn from, and it's a tool not only to teach others, but this chart, and a lot of people believe what the, the, uh, the dispensation of grace is based on the mystery and not on prophecy. But if you understand this chart, it will just not only, only confirm what you believe, it will give you the foundation for understanding it. And the more we understand it, the better then we're going to be able to, to, uh, to share it with others. We believe it. Have you ever been in a situation where you believe something to be true based on verses that you've heard and all, but you really didn't understand it enough to be able to teach it to someone else? That's what learning our chart can do for us. That's what, that's what it, it's a tool to come about and, to, and to, uh, to do it. Is it perfect? No, what is? You know, just a believer <laughs> who's perfect in Christ Jesus. But what a fantastic tool. The number of people that believe in the dispensation of grace, but yet fail to understand it on a level of where they can communicate that truth to other people. Well, when the Apostle Paul went to Galatia, uh, as almost everywhere that he went, he met with resistance. He met with people who opposed him. One, they opposed him as the Apostle, and other people opposed his, his message. And it was, we know that it was fierce, and, uh, and so Paul had to defend himself. Many people have speculated why Paul uh, wants to continue to state that 10 out of his 13 epistles, he, he comes right out of the gate saying, I am an apostle. Well, why, what was so hard about that? And there were reasons that Paul had to defend his apostleship. And the defense of his apostleship was to separate himself from the twelve apostles. His ministry was not based on the, the ministry that Christ had according to prophecy. During the three years that he walked on the face of this earth, his ministry, Paul's ministry, was unique. There was no connection between their ministry except for it's the same Lord Jesus Christ. But it's not Christ according to prophecy. It is as Romans 16, 25, and 26 say, 
It is the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret, but now is going to be revealed. So if it was secret, who was it secret from? Everybody, including, you know, everybody. And it wasn't revealed until it was time. That's why Paul says he's the due time testifier. When the time became right, Paul did that. But why do you suppose that, that Paul, as we understand, the reason he was uh, uh, de declaring his apostleship and defending it, and uh, because during Paul's day, he had to prove that he was acting on behalf of God. He had to prove that he had been sent from God. It's like going back into time past with Moses, when Moses uh, had been commissioned by God, and Moses says, these people aren't going to believe me. What are you going to give me so that they will believe me? And he said, I'll be with you. And I will prove to them. I'll use miracles, signs, and wonders, and I'll prove to them. Well, that's what Paul was having to do. Paul was having to defend his right to be called an apostle. Verse 1, Paul an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. I think we noted last time we studied here that uh, the Apostle Paul's, the beginning of his ministry is not uh, with Christ's birth. It's not with his ministry on the earth. It, it, uh, it's not really with the crucifixion, although he talks about the crucifixion. Paul's ministry starts with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says he's raised from the dead according to my gospel. Paul says that, that uh, and, and, uh, and that was different. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he, and uh, talking about the resurrection, he says, whether it's they or I, so we preach, and so ye believe. Who were the they? The twelve apostles. Who was I? That was Paul. And whether they preach about the resurrection or I preach around the resurrection, there are people who believe it, and rightly so, because they were dispensational issues at the time. There is no option about which message of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ for a believer to believe today. Because there's only one message about the resurrection which brings forth life and brings forth joy and brings forth encouragement. The kingdom gospel and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, read Acts chapter 2. And they never once brought it up as good news. They said, by wicked hands you have taken and crucified the Lord of glory. The good news was that God raised him from the dead in spite of the wicked hands that crucified him. In spite of all that. And God said, I raised him up to set him on the throne. God says, the kingdom for you is still in play. And it was. All the way from Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 7. And when they stoned Stephen... The message after the Lord Jesus Christ returned to heaven and the message that, the, that Christ's disciples and his, the little flock went out and preached, it was a message that the nation, that Israel as a nation, must repent so that God, that means change their mind about Christ, so that God could send him back to the earth. You know, we don't have a message about that we have to believe so that God will send uh, the Lord Jesus Christ back to the earth. This is the dispensation of the grace of God. This is a time and a place, if you will, and a dispensation where our performance has nothing to do with God's plan. When God's plan is right, when the time is right, the dispensation of grace will end. The, the Lord Jesus Christ will come in the air, catch away uh, us up in the air so that we will be forever with the Lord. And that's different from what Israel's hope was. Same Lord Jesus Christ, but different messages and different timetables. When Paul says in verse 1, Paul an apostle not of man, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, it's a statement of defense. He says, I didn't choose to do this on my own. No committee, no group of people came about. No one, no group of men laid their hands on me and endorsed my ministry and sent me out. I received it by the risen and glorified Lord Jesus Christ. 
Perhaps Paul's claim to be an apostle was uh, necessary because in Paul's day, there were already how many apostles? There were 12. There were 12 apostles in Paul's day. Now, there was going to be the matter of having to replace Judas. We know that there were 12 apostles, and we know what the ministry of those apostles were. Come to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28. Matthew 19. And verse 28. He says, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of God shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. You know, that's a promise. That's a necessity for Israel. Twelve thrones. 12 tribes, the head person, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Redeemer, the one who's bringing all the blessings and all the hope and all the empowerment for living throughout the kingdom. And there's going to be 12, judging 12 men sitting on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. Well, that turns out to be a problem. Because Judas betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ, and then Judas went out and hanged himself. And he's dead. So how many apostles do they have after Judas hanged himself? They had 11. How many do they need? 12. They got 12 thrones. And it wouldn't be right for one tribe not to be represented in the kingdom of heaven here on earth. So now we have a... Uh, an opportunity, a, we have something that the remaining disciples of the Lord need to do. In Acts chapter 1, come to Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, after the death, the burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, he spends 40 days with his disciples teaching them about things which pertain to the kingdom of God. The good news about God and his kingdom. Not the good news about God about the dispensation of grace in the church, the body of Christ. But the good news of God about the kingdom. And so he spends 40 days with his disciples. And he's instructing them of what to do and what to say and how to carry on. And it's going to be in his absence. Because shortly... <laughs> After that 40th day, he is going to ascend back up into heaven and he will send his disciples out with a message to confirm what it's going to take for Christ to come back to the earth. He says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of of the earth. Jerusalem, Judea, see it getting bigger and bigger, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the world, earth, is the rest of the world. What is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit going to provide for Christ's disciples in their ministry, post-ascension ministry? It is to give them power so that they, in verse 8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon me for this purpose, ye shall, that ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. What was one of the great benefits of the Holy Spirit pouring out upon his disciples at Pentecost? You know, it was as the breaking down of the language barrier that came in. You know, they, uh, before then, from the time of the Tower of Babel, what we see and what we hear and, uh, and see is that uh, languages confounded people. They, they, they couldn't communicate. As God separated the people and the land masses started drifting apart, those on one side didn't speak what the other one on the other side were, and, and I'm sure that was confusing. I'm sure it was alarming and disturbing. 
But all these years later now, what God is going to do with giving the ministry of the Holy Spirit is he is going to break down the language barrier and there will be not one single person who has to go anywhere to learn another language. That would help me out tomorrow night. <laughs> I can brush up on my French, but uh, it ain't going to work. But praise the Lord, there'll be somebody here who does know the language or there. So it says here in, in verse, chapter 2, verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing of a mighty wind and filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set a, upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard him speak. And every man heard them speak in his own language. So now it fell upon his disciples, but when they spoke, the ministry was, they were still speaking the same language that they ever always spoke. I mean, inside of that, we, we would read, and we could read how many different people and how many different languages. In verse 8 it says, And how hear we every man in our own tongue where we were born, Parth Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and dwellers at Mesopotamia, and Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, and Egypt, and in, the, in parts of uh, Libya and Cyrene, and strangers from Rome, Jews, and proselyte, Cretes, and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues and uh, the, work, the wonderful works of God. So it wasn't that, you know, one-on-one -on -one <laughs> this was working. When they spake, everybody heard in their tongue where they were from. And all these people were there. All these languages were representative. If there were a hundred more countries and places and regions that were there, they would have all heard them speak in other tongues because that was the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He was going to break down the barrier between them to go out and to preach the good news and the gospel of the kingdom. So wherever they went, they wouldn't have to learn the other language because the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it was going to begin in Jerusalem and then go out into Judea and then into Samaria and they would carry. That is the gift of tongues. It's not speaking in some unknown language. It's not just some babble. It's not that the Holy Spirit has given you something to say that nobody else has ever heard before in their, in their life. The confirmation was if I had the gift of the Holy Spirit you could hear me in your language regardless of what the language was. That was good news. You know, the, because he broke down the language barrier that he put up in Genesis chapter in Genesis chapter 12. So he spends this time with them. And, uh, and so they did. He says, uh, and he's going to send them to Jerusalem. And he says, I'm going to want you to wait. And they made the trip to Jerusalem. And he's going to wait for the gift of the Holy Ghost to come at Pentecost. And so when they get there, though, they, they understand that they have uh, some business to get down to. And look at the, uh, Acts chapter 1 and verses 15 to 17. Acts chapter 1, verse 15 to 17. And in those days, this is when they're back in Jerusalem now, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of the names together were about 120. Men and brethren, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost spake by the mouth of, by the mouth of David, by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was a guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and hath obtained part of this ministry. What caused him to obtain part of the ministry? He was numbered with them. He was numbered with them as an apostle, not just a disciple. He is one of the twelve. Verse 18, and uh, we'll take verse 18 and go all the way down to verse 20. And he says, 
Uh, now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong he burst asunder in the midst and all of his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem insomuch that the field is called in their proper tongue al Sadama, that is to say the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein and his bishopric let another take. You know what bishopric would be? Let his authority, let his position, let somebody else take it because we need somebody to sit on that 12th throne. So 21 to 23. He says, Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. So here they come. I've even had people argue over here, arguing, well, why did they only pick two? See, they were being sloppy. You know why they picked two? There probably wasn't that many people to pick from. I know there's 120 people there, but you had to be with them every single step of the way from the moment that John baptized them until they were there in Acts chapter 1, and Christ left and ascended back up into heaven. Not very many people qualified for that. But we also want to bear in mind, because of the attack on Paul's apostleship, we have to just bear in mind here, Paul did not qualify. Doesn't matter how many books he wrote in the, uh, the so-called New Testament. Doesn't matter. Paul didn't qualify to sit on one of the twelve thrones to judge the twelve tribes of the nation of Israel. And on top of that, that's not what his message was about. Paul had nothing to do with the kingdom program. Verse 24 to 26. And they prayed and they said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So you take 11 plus 1, and we're set. People have, they've looked at what Matthias had said. You know, Matthias doesn't even get an honorable mention, ever, other than this day. And look at the Apostle Paul. He authored 13 books. He was the, he was the one who is given credit for establishing all these churches over all these regions. But what people fail to recognize is he's not under Israel's great commission. He is under his own commission as ordained by God to go out and to preach the gospel uh, of the grace of God. But it says, they prayed, and he says, Lord, we're going to cast lots to make sure we pick the person you have chose. It wasn't that they were leaving it up to them. Uh, this is an endorsement for, what is it, craps or dice or whatever they would call that today. Um, it might be fun to play, uh, but I noticed, uh, or I remember, that game's played right on the ground. <laughs> A lot of bending over, and I'm not, going, I'm not going to be able to do that. So I'm glad that we don't play that game. But it is something that was vitally important to the, to, uh, to, uh, to, the, to the nation of Israel. Because now, the kingdom can come. And when the time is right, the kingdom can come. Because they are ready for the kingdom to come from the apostle's standpoint. But there is still one thing that must be done... And it's a national issue with Israel and God. Look at Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. And verse 19 to 21. It says in verse 19, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When? When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. How will they know that their sins have been blotted out? This isn't about individuals now. This is a national message. How will they know their sins have been blotted out? Because the Lord Jesus Christ will be in their presence again. 
And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his prophets, since the world began. The times of restitution of all things. Well, that could be a lot of different things. All. But let's look back at verse 18. It says, But those things which God before has showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. That's why he says to Israel, Repent ye therefore and be converted. He says the issue is not anything that's left up to the Messiah which was in your midst, which when, you, when Christ is on the earth, John the Baptist said, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know how close the kingdom was when Christ was walking on the face of his earth? On the face of the earth? It was right there within their reach. And it's still within their reach. And they just, all they need to do is to change their mind. We know it's not an individual issue. 3,000 one day, 5,000 another day. There were people who were being, who were being converted because they changed their mind about who Christ was. As Peter would preach to them and as, as others would preach to them, they would preach about the sufficiency of Christ and his ministry according to, the, to prophecy, according to what the prophet said. And he says there is nothing else for him to do and there's only one thing left for us to do. And you'd think that would be the simplest choice in the world to make, wouldn't you? We just need to change our mind about Christ. But guess what? We know the rest of the story, don't we? They did not do it, and Christ wasn't sent back, and there is no kingdom. But it's unfortunate the way that the 11 apostles have been maligned and attacked because of their choice of Matthias. And I'm wondering, have they not read Acts chapter 1? Do they not know the life and the ministry of the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, before his name was changed? Do they not know that he was not even there the day that... Uh, as a one of, at least as one of Christ's disciples, the day that John baptized the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't they know that during this time, even after the ascension of Christ, Paul was not a supporter of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 8 and 9 talk about, he says he was breathing out threatenings and slaughter, that if he could find anybody that identified with Jesus as the Christ, he could take them back to Jerusalem and have them put to death. Well, I don't think that's being with <laughs> them from the baptism of John until the Lord Jesus Christ was taken up and uh, went uh, back into heaven and uh, sat down on the right hand of God. So we come along and they are maligned. And even after today, after all these years, if Paul were here, he would have to still defend his apostleship. 2,000 plus years. And Paul would have to come in here and, and defend his right to be the singular, the unique apostle of the Gentiles. What have people done today? Even if they don't say that he was a mistake for the twelve, they believe that Paul simply continued the message that was preached by Christ and Peter and John and James and all the others. And Paul would have to say to them, no, no, that's not me. So defend his apostleship back then because of the, the ministry to the nation of Israel and the rejection and the commingling that went on back then. But today, people are still commingling the, the doctrine. And Paul would have to stand here and stand on the ground and he'd have to preach and he'd say, you know, my apostleship was unique. And you know what unique means? Different. Not the same as anything else. Unlike it. It's not connected. It's different. Paul would have to stand up and say, I am the apostle of the Gentiles. It was never given to me to sit on one of the twelve thrones to judge the twelve tribes of the nation of Israel. And my ministry had nothing to do with bringing in the kingdom. My, Paul would say, my prayer is not, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. 
said, my apostleship is all about the reason that there is a delay in the Lord Jesus Christ coming back to this earth. And it had nothing to do with prophecy. It had everything to do with what Christ had to say. But Paul would have to preach. Come to Romans chapter 11. Paul would have to preach this. And he would have to defend it. And he would have to say over and over. And he would have to do it with conviction. And he would have to say in Romans chapter 11 and verse 13. He says, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office as what? The apostle of of the Gentiles. Now if Paul, you know, we know he didn't meet the qualifications, but there the, the ministry of Paul as the apostle of the Gentiles excludes him from being his ministry being sitting on a throne judging the twelve tribes of the nation of Israel. Because it wasn't that their ministry excluded the Gentiles, but it wasn't to the Gentiles. Their ministry was uh, for everywhere. And so and why did uh, we, we see why did the Gentiles need an apostle? See, we know why the nation of Israel, we know why the little flock needed an apostle so he could take Judas's position. We come to Ephesians chapter two. Ephesians chapter two, verses eleven through uh, thirteen. Ephesians chapter two, verse eleven. He says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at that time ye were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. You know what the Gentiles need? An apostle. They need someone to bring them the message about how things dispensationally has changed. Peter couldn't do it because Peter's message was not about the dispensation of grace. And he says in verse 13, But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes are far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You know, the cross is the central figure of everything that God has ever done. But there were certain things that God did by the cross that were not accomplished at the cross. And what we learn from Paul are those things which Christ accomplished by the cross. Not at the cross. Because Israel and their opportunity for the kingdom was still in play for them. They still had the opportunity to receive it. But now after the rejection of Jesus Christ was complete with the stoning of Stephen. And he says this, verse 13 to 18. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes are far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Who did God make peace with? Did he, did he make peace with men? Or did he make peace with the new man. See, he made peace through the new creature in Christ Jesus. The new creature in Christ Jesus is who God is working with, who has the relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that, that is perfect, that is an example of the workmanship of, of, a, of God created in Christ Jesus. I mean, it was anything and everything. Verse 16, and that he might reconcile both Jew and Gentile. So the one man, the new creature, is made up of Jew and Gentile being brought together. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, not at the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. And you know why we can go to the Father today? Because there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. No more do we go back to Exodus chapter 19 and verse 6 to find out how we could have access to God. Because we don't go through a kingdom of priests. We have access because of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he accomplished at, uh, at Calvary. 
You know, we come and we see, and Paul was not an apostle to anyone but the Gentiles. You could say this time, but of mankind. Such a wonderful message to one who realizes that as a sinner, the Lord Jesus Christ was paving the way for us to be at perfect peace in all areas of our life because of the sufficiency of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when something is sufficient, it would be complete, wouldn't it? How much would be left? Nothing. All a person must do today is believe. Shortly after Paul came to town and began to see people saved, though, there were people who were coming in, and, and they would believe that Christ was the Messiah, the Son of the living God. They would believe that he went to Calvary and that he died and he rose again. But they had no concept of how to believe that Jesus Christ was going to be the sufficiency of all things. That once somebody had trusted Christ, once that they were complete in Christ, there was nothing that was between them and God, and there's nothing, you know, there is nothing that the new man can do that God doesn't accept. There's not one thing, not one act, not one thought, not one deed that he can do that is going to be rejected by God. Because if there is a fault in the new man, then it's God's fault. And God's not faulty. When it says we are his workmanship, that's better than any craftsman tool you've ever gotten. It even has a lifetime guarantee, but they break. Not when the new man is made after the image of God. He's perfect in Christ Jesus. But they would come along, and, and those, the Judaizers, the legalists, those of the daysers, and they came trying to mix Christ's work at Calvary, the issue of justification. You know what the issue of justification means? Justification is the free gift. You shouldn't even have to say free. But it is the gift of God. And you know what it is? It is not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. So, I don't know how many different ways you can analyze that. You know, what does it mean? It's not like any gift I've given, or any gift that you've given, that may have even a sewing thread attached to it, but there is something that we have attached to it. It may not be anything that we voice, or not anything that we, uh, you know, say out loud to other people, but in our mind, what is the least uh, somebody can do when you give them something? Thank you! <laughs> You know, we don't ask people to dedicate the rest of their life to the Lord because I gave them a gift. But that's what a lot of other people think when Christ gives them their gift. Well, that must mean that I'm going to dedicate and I'm going to give my life to the Lord forever. And I promise I'll never do this. I promise I'll never do that. I promise I'll always do this and always do that. Because if I don't, God's going to take that gift away from me. That's bad doctrine. People who come up with that idea, though, they mix and mingle the issues of sanctification, I mean of justification, with sanctification. Justification is the free gift. It's the gift that God gave us because Christ paid for that gift. And God can freely give it to us. Sanctification has nothing to do with the gift other than the fact that now that we have been justified by faith, we now are in a position to live a sanctified life. We couldn't do it before. You know, would you be surprised that there are probably some unbelievers who live a life which is more honorable, who sin less, who do more? I'm speaking to those that don't come here. I'm, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> I wasn't thinking of anybody in this room when I said that, other than myself. But the point is, sanctification is something that we do. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. When Paul says in Romans chapter 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, talking to believers, 
by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It doesn't say, and if you don't, I'm going to take my gift back from you. Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2 is not about justification. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 is about sanctification. It's about what we can do so that we can present our bodies to Christ to be used for his service. It's a willingly, uh, a choice made by free will of what we're going to do with our body. Many people get a, have a hard time of wrapping their head around this, but you know what? God doesn't love us anymore if we do, or any less if we don't. Because God is not going to love our old man. And the old man is either the one that uh, he can do it, he can do it in his flesh, and, uh, and make a pretty good servant probably. But you know what God says? He says, you know, I want you to do like I've done. I want you to recognize uh, your flesh to be dead indeed unto sin. I want you to live in the fact that you're alive unto God. So the believer operating on the principles of grace committed to us by the Apostle Paul is a wise master builder. That is the only way that we can present our bodies as a living sacrifice. And it's holy. And it's acceptable unto God. And it's reasonable if we do that. Not expected, not demanding, but if we're looking for motivation, if we're thinking in our mind this is too hard to do, you know who's thinking that. Never forget about the struggle that your old man is going to have to do, that your old man will have with grace motivation. But not the new man. He can do it. So come along, come back with me if you will. To Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Verses 6 and 7. He says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. 6 to 9. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have, that we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. It doesn't say, let God curse him. No. Would God curse him? No. What if somebody got saved and they came under the influence of a Judaizer and they were preaching a message that they called the gospel, but it was a gospel based on continued acceptance with God based on doing. Doing what? Keeping the law. What if I don't do all the right things today? We'll flip in your law book and find out what the sacrifice is. And you go down to the, to, the, to the temple and you make the sacrifice. So but Paul just says if, if somebody preaches something different, he says, I don't care who it is, an angel or whoever. You know, in the book of Revelation, there will be an angel that comes down preaching a message. And it's going to be different from that which the apostle Paul was preaching. And if an angel came today and preached the gospel of peace according to the book of Revelation, Paul would say, let him be accursed. Now, we learn today from Romans chapter 8 that if anybody's going to bring anything against the believer today, no one has the authority. God could condemn a person. The Lord Jesus Christ could condemn someone. But the truth of the gospel is, he's not. How can you be forgiven of all of our trespasses? Every single one. Past sins, present sin, future sins. Because the blood of Christ was so sufficient that Christ shed blood paid completely for our sins. 
Well, how could God ever hold, a, hold us accountable for him? God is not going to judge us for that. He's not going to punish us for that. Because the only one that has, I'm going to preach this, and I, and I, I trust it's, a, it's something that we grasp. God does not have a relationship with the old man. He is not holding the new man accountable for the failures of the flesh. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 7, and he teaches us, that there is no value, in fact, there is damage when we try to control our flesh with our flesh. The only way we can control our flesh is through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's where the victory comes. It is yielding of our own free will to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Where are we going to find out about that? Are you going to find out about that at the, uh, at the bookstore or the library or standing in line at uh, Walmart or Publix? No. Why? Because this is the Word of God. This is the book that's going to tell us. And it's not a 10-step process. It's not a 15-step process. It's not a 3-step process. It is just that we allow it to happen. We don't have the time today. We won't go to Colossians 3. But in Colossians 3, you start reading in verse 1 and reading all the way through down, all of a sudden it says, Let. Let, allow, just give, turn it over to the Lord and the Holy Spirit, and it will take place. Having trouble with sin? Let the Holy Spirit take care of it for you. If you're having trouble with motivation, if you're having trouble with ministry and service, let the Holy Spirit take it. He won't do it for us, but he will empower us to do it. So come with me, and you know, this was a, a, a situation with the Apostle Paul, and they, they, they turned on him because of the ministry of others. They turned on him, and they, they came to him, and they, they wanted to stop his ministry. It wasn't malicious in that sense. It wasn't malicious in the fact that they came. They came out of love. They came out of concern. You better believe they understood what it meant to fall into the hands of an angry God. And they fell into the hands of angry God when they did not keep the law. One of the greatest verses that Paul has given us for today. Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. The simplest solution to controlling sin in our life is to recognize that grace reigns. We're going to read, I said two, but come to Romans chapter 5. And it's, two's turned into three. Romans chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. You know, you couldn't say that under the law. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, what's the difference in it coming through Jesus than coming through performance? Everything. <laughs> Impossible. Possible. <laughs> and he says in chapter 6 and verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? Because grace reigns. Because grace replaced the law. Because the law is not one that gives empowerment for sin. Law only proves you're guilty. You ever been to court? You spend your time trying to prove whether you're guilty or innocent. But it's the court's decision what that might be. But with the law, it never came out that you were unguilty. <laughs> The law said every single time you failed, you were guilty. Did that give the nation of Israel the ability to overcome the flesh? No. But it says, for sin, 614, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Paul says, let him be accursed. Accursed is not damned. Paul had no authority to send anybody to hell. Paul didn't have any authority to do anything but to encourage the churches in Galatia 
when faced with somebody coming and preaching a gospel, which he says in, in chapter 1, which is not another, though there be some that would trouble you, you know why it wasn't another? You add law to grace, and it is no longer grace. You know how much law you can add to grace to the story of grace? Just a little bit. You know it doesn't work the other way? You can't take enough grace to cancel out law. You just have to separate yourself from it. So he says, but Paul didn't have any ability to do that. When it says, let him be accursed, it means put him out. <laughs> Excommunicate yourself from him. Separate him from the babes in Christ Jesus, which you may have in there. Get him out so that you can cut clean all of that confusion which is being brought in. And you know what the purpose of separation is? It's restoration. And the way that people would once again be restored, openly restored back into the fellowship of the churches of Galatia was to believe and to preach that when they trusted Christ as their Savior, that they were complete in him. That's a great message from the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatia. Galatians, let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for who you created us to be in Christ Jesus. We're so thankful for that, that uh, relationship that we have with you, which is unfettered. There's, there's, no, there's nothing to it except for all that you have done for us. We can't mess it up. We can't change your mind about who we are in Christ Jesus. We can only exalt your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, through the decisions that we make, that we, through the Spirit, allow the deeds of our flesh to be put to death, and then we serve the Lord today according to the new creature, the new man, that which you have a relationship with, and who you've empowered. And may our life be as that. May the life of our local church at Fellowship Bible Church, may it exemplify and exalt your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, through the decisions that we make. And we give you the praise and glory for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.